and I put this up at the beginning. I'm a member of the Australian Golf Heritage Society. And you can see what we do. <clears throat> My main interest is in the third item, history and research and education. And I head up a small three-person subcommittee there. And uh, one of the services we provide through our website, if you've got any question about golf history, put it to us. And we generally are able to answer the question. And the Baraksi Golf in Sydney. Did you say? The Brassy Magazine. The that Brassy you? Magazine, that's, that's us. The one the yes. That's you, us. That's you, yes. Sorry. Um, Golf in Sydney in 1839. This is the topic. Now, you may not know much about um, um, golf in Australia, but apart from the story, the, the early golf in Australia, what I hope you get from this lecture is a couple of things. One is the importance of evidence to back up any historical claim, and particularly the importance of the primary source evidence. Now, that can take many forms. But generally, what we're looking for is a document contemporary with the event. And generally speaking, we look for official documents or documents by eyewitnesses, reliable eyewitnesses, and more and more in these times with the internet and the great search machines, we rely on contemporary newspapers, contemporary with the event. So I hope you will pick a little bit of that. And what I'm talking to you about is fairly in-depth research. If you want to know more about it, I've got a couple of copies for anyone who would like to see them after the lecture. Something point, point it at the laptop, Michael. It should, it should make the laptop. Sometimes happens. This works quite well. Uh, yeah. Use the, me, the down me, button. Let me do that. I'll do it. If you just give me a okay. show you my next time. I'll come once more with it. If you, if you actually press it at the laptop, Michael, hmm? press point it at the laptop, and it should be working. Yeah. Than the screen, so. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Alexander Brody Spark, you see that nice engraving there, which comes from his great grandson, in turn, it comes from the Mitchell Library in Sydney. Now, who was he? He was born in Elgin. At the age of about 20, like many young Scotsmen, he made his way to London, where the money was to be made, because he had a reasonable uh, Scottish education. He got a job very easily as a clerk in a counting house, and of course, lots of Scotsmen there to get connections. He did very well for himself uh, <coughs> after about 10 years. He had made a lot of money. He was able to make the grand tour of Europe. He hobnobbed with no less than William Wordsworth, because Alexander had some literary aspirations. He had he'd done well enough to put together a hundred pounds, get the necessary references, and apply for a land grant, a land grant in in Australia which he got. And off he went, and he arrived in Australia in 1823. <clears throat> now, he was really smart, because within 10 days, he had a store open. 
for business with goods to sell. He'd obviously brought them with him. And his diaries start in 1836, and from those, we quickly gather that he had his finger in many pies. He had his store, he was a shipping agent, he was a ship owner, he was director of insurance companies, director of more than one bank, he owned an auction house, he had the greatest art collection in Australia, including the Rembrandt and a few other well-known names, and hey ho, failure. I'll press the down button, shall I? Uh, yeah. okay. And he was wealthy enough to engage one of the best architects of his time, John Birch, and this is still as his, his bachelor pad. And it has extensive lawns going down to the Cook River. He has his own boatman, his own boat to take him across the river. There's extensive buildings behind kitchens and stables, but he didn't have that modern on the smoke <laughs> Uh, he was also a philanthropist. He was very instrumental and in put up a lot of his own money to get the first Anglican church built in, in Sydney, and I think in Australia, St. Peter's, it still stands today. And although he was of the merchant class, he became something of an establishment figure. He was on speaking terms with the governor. Uh, he was patron of the Botanical Society. He started the subscription library, which today is the State Library of New South Wales and the Mitchell Library for Important Collections. And he was also a founding member of the Australian Club, a city club. in the style of the Athenium and the like in, in London. And he was not only a founding member, he was a trustee. So he was also a magistrate, and he's often referred to as the respectable Sydney merchant. Now, next question is, What does he have to do with golf? Well, Alexander Brody Spark was a diarist, and his diaries run from 1836 till the time of his death in 1854. And they're fairly complete, and they are held at the Mitchell Library in Sydney. They were donated in 1961 by his granddaughter, Madeleine Spark. And if you create a great <coughs> fuss with the curator, uh, and you have the right kind of library card, you can go there and you can get out the original volumes. Two bound volumes, 600 full scrap pages in copper plate. Uh, and they are a valuable historia, his, historical document, uh, great insights into the social and economic life of uh, uh, early colonial New South Wales. Now, an important goal because. <coughs> Give us, so give us the first evidence, uh, talking reliable evidence of golf being seen. You see that word there, golf, golf club, but I don't expect you to read that. 
uh, I'll give you transcript. And you see on the 25th of May, 1839, Captain George Ferrier and Messrs. George and Adam Wilson commence operations at Gross Farm on behalf of the Gulf Farm. And I will show you the second entry on the 1st of June, one week later, a Saturday, of course. And again, you'll see that little golf club institute. And again, I think I will show this, and I will read it out very carefully. The NS Wales Golf Club instituted. Many members on the field played my first game Mr. Duguy gave a small dinner on the occasion at which were present Captains Ferrier and Murray, Mr. Duguy, Messrs. John and William Brown, Messrs. George and Adam Wilson, and Mr. Alexander. Kept it up later. <laughs> now, these diaries first came to the attention of historians by a book by two scholars, and a very scholarly book, Abbott and Little, in 1976. And then they came to the attention to golfers based on research by a person called David Innes, who was a bit of a historian. And he published an article in 1992, in November. Now, a little bit about his article is very important because he, he really brings it to the attention of the golfing historians in Australia and the world. But I will talk about the shortcomings of this research <laughs> as I go along. First thing to note was he published in a very popular magazine, and of course there were no references to sources of evidence that you could assume that he had read the diaries because he talked to the diaries. <coughs> he said there were only five entries on golf, and you see two. He suggested that the golf club was an offshoot of the Australian club, the city club, that was founded in 1838 and is still the oldest club of its kind in Australia. He also, on a visit to England, met a historian called David Stirk, who had written the history of Royal Blackheath, Henderson and Stirk, the authors. And Stirk gave him a very interesting extract from the Blackheath archives. And I'm going to read that out to you. Too much text to put on there. This is dated the 2nd of October, 1841. The secretary presented a gallon from the captain of the New South Wales Golf Club, Alex Brodie Spark, Esquire, on the occasion of the birth of a son and heir, when the health of Mrs. Spark and the young golfer was drank with all the honours. Field Marshal Lindsay proposed, and Captain Cameron seconded that A.B. Spark Esquire be henceforth an honorary member of the club, which was carried unanimously, and the secretary was requested to announce the same to him. Now, for your information, the gallon refers to a gallon of claret. 
but in all probability it was a guinea to buy the planet rather than a gun. Now, in 2014, in Sydney, we had a little loose gather gathering, loose gathering for dinner of golf historians. We chatted about this and that. And after some wine, I said, you know, it'd be interesting to look at the original diaries. And uh, my colleague, Norman Richardson, and I did think that was a very good idea. And we made a lot of fuss. We went to the state library and we got out diaries and what we found out was that although Innes had said there were only five entries, there were in fact ten. And they extended from the 25th of May 1839 to the 17th of August in the same year. So that's only a period of a few, few weeks. The other thing that Innes didn't get was when he gave the extract of that entry, it became clear he hadn't gone to the original diaries, he'd gone to a book about the diaries to Abbott and Little. And Abbott and Little, if you don't read carefully, you think you're getting the whole diaries, but you're not. You have to read the introduction very carefully. And most importantly, the names of all the players were cut out of that second entry. So, was it an offshoot of the Australian club? Again, we researched the archives of the Australian club, they've got a lot. And the only member of the Australian club was Spark himself. So the conclusion was it was not an offshoot of the Australian club. The other shortcoming in Innes' research is he never attempted to explain what triggered the start. And he never attempted to explain why did it have such a short life. And most importantly, although he gave the extract from Blackheath, it just cried out for more research. What was the connection to the Blackheath Golf Now I mentioned Gross Farm, and I will show you uh, a few This is Gross Farm, and if you don't know Sydney, it wouldn't have might mean very much to you. But <clears throat> that is an area of about 60 to 65 hectares. At the time of Spark, it was used as grazing land for the governor's livestock, particularly his bullocks, right? And today, it's quite near the center of Sydney, and today it's well built up. Um, this, this little point out here is a public park. And you can see the remains of a swampy area, a nice lake. And in fact, although there were 65 acres, you can be pretty sure they kept the high ground because the low ground was very swampy. And if you're using a feathery ball, do not want to get it wet. And the rest of the area is occupied by the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital and the, I should say, parts of the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, which is very extensive, and the main campus of uh, the University of Sydney. Just to show you how well built up it is now, that is the quadrangle in Great Hall of the University of Sydney. A nice Gothic building dating from about 1855. 
These are some of the early buildings of the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, named after Queen Victoria's uh, son. He was nearly assassinated in Australia. Uh, and that's Victoria Park with the lake and everything you can see. <coughs> so, Norman Richardson and I, we decided that we needed to do a lot more research. And the first thing was that I undertook to read the diaries from cover to cover and in their original form. And they give you incredible insights into life in early colonial New South Wales. But what are the research questions we wanted to answer? Number one, what was the trigger that started golf on the 25th of May, 1839? Second, why did it have such a short life? Third, what exactly was the Blackheath connection? And tied up with that, of course, is who was the key figure in getting that golf played at the end of the golf? And the answer to this <coughs> lies in the key people. We'll start with Brody Spark. Now, we quickly realized that Brody Spark was not a golfer, apart from what we see in the diaries. We know that because of the diary entries. If he played golf beyond those 10, he would have written about it. Right? And he talks about playing his first game with Mr. I rather fancy that was the first game of golf he ever played. Because in the Mitchell Library, there are also his London diaries, Sparks London diaries, and his London correspondence. And while he was in London, he had plenty of opportunity to go to Blackheath and have a game. He toured around Scotland midway through his London trip, and he visited this doorknock walk along the Aberdeen Sands, he does not once mention golf, right? And I will go on and talk more about the Blackheath archives, but looking through the Blackheath archives, there's no mention of him ever being Blackheath. What Sparks role was, obviously the diary, and without him we wouldn't have the evidence. So he's important. Spend. But <clears throat> I think he was the fixer. He was the one who knew the governor. He would be the one who would organize the use of Gross Farm, right? And all the people mentioned in diaries playing golf, they are business associates and friends of Spa. The second important person is John Masson. <clears throat> now, he didn't actually play golf at Gross Farm, but we know from the London diaries uh, that John Masson was a very close friend of Spa. And we know also from the diaries that Spa and Masson both came from Elgin and in London. In the early days, they were in the same kind of things. We know from the diaries that Masson, who was sh Spark's shipping agent in London, was much more important than that. You sh you sh when Masson gets into financial difficulties, Spark writes long screeds about you know, how sorry he is for Mr. Masson. And you have Spark buying land for Masson speculative land in Sydney. You have 
massive coming out to Sydney in the middle and late 1840s, visiting Spark, staying with Spark, socializing with Spark. So they're very, very close. And here comes the first of the great Eureka moments in research. And I had the copy of Henderson Stern history of Royal Blackheath. And I'd looked at it and again. I thought, I wonder if Massey gets a mention in history. Looked up the index, sure enough. Massey turned to page whatever. He's an important person in Royal Blackheath. He was the captain in 1835 and the long serving secretary of Blackheath. Remember, who presented the guinea on Spark's behalf? The, the gallant claret, I should say, who was instructed to inform Clark that he'd been, uh, inform Spark that he'd been made an honorary member. The secretary, and later again from the archives, yes, he was, John Masson was the secretary attending that event where Spark was made an honorary member. So you're beginning to see the Blackheath connection coming about. The next important person is Adam Wilson. He was mentioned as playing golf and one of the persons to start the golf operations. And he was a close friend and associate of Spa. And um, by going to a very important rare book by Hughes, written in 1897 about Royal Blackheath, we were, and then later on, checking the, the membership uh, lists. We did know that before coming to Australia, Adipos had been a member of Royal Blackheath. And just to absolutely confirm that, in a newspaper report of August 1846, it reported the mayor of Sydney's fancy dress ball. And who should be there but Adam Wilson? And what was his fancy dress? The uniform of a Blackheath golf. So this Blackheath is all coming together. Now we come to the next important person, Captain James Ferrier. Now, Captain James Ferrier, at the time, was the captain of the Lady Fitzherbert. And we first meet him in the Spark Diaries before the golf in September 1839. And Spark makes a big play of meeting him. Because Spark's so all these businesses. She makes this big play of meeting Captain Ferrier. And they sit down, put their heads together, and you have to go to the original diaries to pick this up. Ferrier informs him that there's money to be made in sugar, which I'm sure Captain Ferrier knew quite well. But he persuades Captain Ferrier to sail to Mauritius and come back to Sydney with uh, a load of sugar. And he takes a moiety in the venture, which I think is old fashioned for a share, usually a half share. And he gives uh, Ferrier 300 pounds, and Ferrier goes and comes back, and he arrives in April the next year. And no doubt they made a lot of money. And the golf begins. May of that same year, not long after Captain Ferrier comes back. Now, Captain Ferrier has a problem. He cannot get a crew to sail out of Sydney and back to, to, to London. He's stuck in the port, and he doesn't leave until September of the same year. 
then those last few weeks, he's extremely busy because he's actually got a crew, he's actually got them prepared. So, now, while he was in Sydney and stuck, he socialized greatly and stayed with Spock. And later on, in 1841, he comes back with a new ship and he sells shares in his new ship to Spock, 7 out of 464. So these two are quite close, right? And that short period of golf is contained within Captain Ferrier's stay stuck in Sydney with for a while not much to do. Then comes the next great Eureka moment. I really don't know what I keyed into Google, but I obviously keyed in the right things. That comes of all things, and his brother Charles, Charles was, uh, was, uh, was a surgeon in the Madras Army, in other words, the British and the East Army. He died at his house, and, and as we'll find out later, Charles was a prominent member of Lord Blackheath. So, at the very good suggestion of, uh, of the Derbyshire archives, he said, why don't you look in, in, at Captain Ferrier's will that might tell you a little bit more about it. So this is the other unique moment. And I really don't know if you've ever searched the archives, the British archives in Kew. But anyway, you can do it online. You keep a few words and likely things come up think you want the likely things, so you give them three quid, and within half a minute, you've got the will and the history. Uh, and that was very, very revealing. It clearly identified James Ferrier, master of the Lady Fitzgerald, residing at Blackheath. And you learn a great deal about it. He was a man of means, and it's important uh, that you pick up from that that his wife's name was Francis Dick, and there's no mention of children in the will. Everything goes to his wife. We also check the census records of the period, electoral rolls, etc. And safely assume that Captain Ferrier had no children or not surviving to adult. Uh, that's important because uh, many people would like to think that uh, Captain Ferrier was the great great grandfather of Jim Ferrier, who as golfers you probably know, had a sterling amateur career in Australia in the 1930s went to America, became professional, and won the 1947 US PGA. Well, from the information we got about from his will and from other things, we can assure you that, that Captain James Ferry was not the great great grandfather of Jim Ferry. Uh, that's something of an aside. So, the decision was made. We actually had this almost written up and ready to go. That we should really look at the Black, uh, Blackheath archives and look at them very carefully. Now, through the British Golf Collectors Society, you have many good connections in the historical world. And uh, Richard lost his name. Richard Williams is the archivist there, so it was easy enough to get you know, permission to look at the archives. Yes, Captain Ferrier lived at Blackheath. Did he play golf? Well, 
did he not play golf? We found 100 entries on Captain Ferrier playing golf at Blackheath. He was a very, very prominent member. On occasion, he chaired meetings. Uh, you have him playing golf, you've got the results, you've got the betting books. Uh, he, he had a gamble like many of the other golfers of his time, many of the golfers of the day. And he was a very, very prominent member. So, have we answered our uh, research questions? Well, the trigger to golf, everything points to Captain Ferrier, an enthusiastic golfer. The playing of golf coincides with his visit. We can speculate a little bit, and it's probably correct that he traveled with his clubs and his golf balls. And if he found a bit of land and a few people, you know, he played. Because you don't need a prepared golf course to play golf. Right? You just need a bit of reasonable land or a, a beach somewhere. And why did it have short, such a short life? All the evidence points to it stopped when he left. And even although it was much, a few years later, when uh, Spark was made an honorary member of Blackheath, referred to as the captain, the probability is that at first that earlier phase. And then what is the connection to Blackheath? Well, the connection is now staring us in the face. It's Masson, the secretary, and Ferrier, the keen golfer, and who is the key figure in all of this? Well, Spark's important because he gives us the evidence, but the key figure in all of this is Ferrier. And just to wind up, what I've given you also is a, a picture of one aspect of one of the most important stories in golf. That is the spread of golf out from Scotland to the rest of the world, where it is now, it's, a, you know, it's played almost everywhere. And it's one of the largest, if not the largest, participants for in the world. And uh, it started in Scotland with the three people born in Elton. Spark, as and as we found out much later in our research through that wonderful research in the British newspapers, the announced the death of Captain Ferrier, and they announced the death of his brother Charles later, and they were citizens of Elgin. So there it is, golf spread from Scotland to the rest of the world, one of the great stories of golf. That is as much as I have to say, and I hope you ask me lots of questions. Yeah. Thank you very much, Michael. Um